Hello, I'm Daniel Lenahan. I'm the founder and uh, immediate past president of the International Cardio-Oncology Society, and I am in practice at St. Francis Healthcare in Cape Girardeau, in Missouri, in the United States. And I was asked to give a, a comment about a major scientific statement that was published in circulation in 2022 about cardio-oncology drug interactions, a scientific statement from the American Heart Association. Uh, this is a very important update uh, and review be because as we have found in the, in the cardio-oncology space over the last 10 to 20 years, that the complexity of the medications has risen so dramatically that it's very difficult to kind of keep this in mind. And this uh, scientific statement was done by uh, a very distinguished list of uh, experts, uh, not only uh, cardiologists, but medical oncologists, as well as pharmacists uh, that have uh, scoured the literature to look for different types of drug to drug interactions that may occur and how this impacts clinical care. Uh, this is a, a very authoritative document that has really an excellent uh, figure one, or I guess it's the only figure that is a mecha mechanistic overview. And that provides a lot of insight for those of us who are trying to understand how these things, how these uh, interactions may occur in, a, in patient care. And then of course, table one of this statement uh, is really a definitive overview of many of the specific uh, research studies or uh, papers that have highlighted these major events. So uh, I won't go into great detail for all of the parts of the of the uh, statement, but I would say that this is this is a very important document to to encourage people to understand about drug, drug, drug interactions, and also how to uh, modify the therapy that you're, that you're giving uh, from a cardio-oncology perspective that may allow patients to continue on their best, uh, best course of cancer therapy. So the the figure, figure and table are really excellent resources. And I will sort of summarize some of the important findings. So the in, uh, table one highlights the pharmacologic interactions that occur with different therapies that are, that are used uh, in the contemporary treatment of cancer. So one of the first major categories is hypertension. So there are a number of new cancer therapies that are potentially very effective for the treatment of cancer that are known to be associated with hypertension. And this is not the usual hypertension that you may have encountered in your uh, practice, where it uh, gradually uh, may develop into a significant problem. The, uh, the hypertension that is typically induced by cancer therapy may be much more rapid onset and much more severe than uh, you know, the essential hypertension that may occur in your average practice. So the entire category of medications known as anti-VEGF or anti-vascular endothelial growth factor or anti-angiogenic based therapy, virtually every drug in that class uh, is known to be associated with hypertension. So there will be a higher incidence of hypertension and each drug may have uh, a differing magnitude of how it will affect the blood pressure, but almost as a class effect, it will cause significant hypertension. The question is, is how severe? And then additional medications that are used commonly that would be known to be associated with hypertension. <clears throat> hypertension includes ibrutinib, which is a brutin, brutin tyrosine kinase inhibitor. And that is a very important treatment for certain types of uh, uh, hematologic malignancies. 
And then carfilzomib, which is a proteasome inhibitor, uh, is also known to cause a certain degree of hypertension. And then abiraterone, which is a uh, androgen uh, receptor blocker that is used in the treatment of prostate cancer. So these are all drugs that are used in practice frequently. So you need to be aware that they have a uh, hypertensive effect. Then, uh, of course, the classic description of cardiotoxicity uh, stems from the use of anthracyclines, which that has been going on for uh, decades. And so that's not really new news. However, we still don't fully understand who is susceptible and how uh, significant the cardiomyopathy or heart failure may become from anthracycline. And so we continue to need to understand how to prevent that from occurring or detect it at an earlier stage where it is responsive to treatment. And then, of course, all HER2-based therapy or, uh, you know, typically for breast cancer, that uh, the classic uh, trastuzumab-based treatment is known to be associated with cardiomyopathy and heart failure. Initially, it was uh, quite high, uh, but then over the years with uh, definitive research studies and finding ways of early detection and protection, the incidence of significant heart failure or cardiomyopathy related to HER2-based therapies is much lower than it was initially. However, it is still a consideration and uh, certainly needs to be thought of. And then one of the uh, more recent complicating factors from a cardiomyopathy point of view is the possible uh, connection to immune checkpoint inhibitors and the, the rates of myocarditis. Now, what we have found is that checkpoint inhibitors are known to augment our immune system to fight off cancer, and they've been very effective in that, uh, in that arena. However, if your immune system is activated and it uh, causes uh, an inflammatory response in a different tissue, then uh, that could, could be a detrimental thing. And what we found is that in the case of myocarditis, that this could potentially be very serious and uh, be life-threatening. So it's a, of great concern. Thankfully, it doesn't happen that often, but, but recognizing it is, is a crucial element. And then the entire concept of prothrombotic or uh, thrombosis generating uh, drug-drug interactions is, is uh, super complex, but also very important in terms of management of patients with cancer. And then of course, the balance of prothrombosis is the risk of bleeding. So I think that this this whole area is very challenging, and you know the drugs that we use in cardiology have direct impact of rates of thrombosis or bleeding uh, when it when it comes to management of these these issues in cancer patients. So table one in the scientific summary highlights some of the more important drugs. Uh, first off, in terms of prothrombotic therapies, the combination of uh, IMIDs or drugs that are used uh, to, to mostly manage multiple myeloma, especially in, in conjunction with dexamethasone, are known to be prothrombotic. And then a drug used for certain hematologic malignancies called panatinib is known to be associated with arterial and vascular events. So these are drugs that we, we need to consider that they are prothrombotic. And then, of course, the antithesis to that is that certain drugs may make, uh, make a bleeding more of a significant risk for a patient. And probably the, the most uh, prominent of those drugs at this point is the BTK inhibitor, Brutinib, which is known to have a increased bleeding complication. The real challenge is, is that uh, that particular medication is associated with atrial fibrillation, which as you all know, would be a drug that we would consider using anticoagulation. 
So you have a drug that is more likely to promote bleeding, and then you have a reason to treat with anticoagulation. So the, the risk of bleeding could be substantially uh, increased. And then lastly, there is some discussion about medications that are known to affect the rhythm, in particular the QT interval. This is a very large and complex topic, but drugs that are known to prolong the QT interval should be considered. And this is especially uh, with supportive medications that are being used in patients with cancer. So for example, uh, anti-nausea medications or antibiotics are notorious for having an effect on the QT interval and coupling that those drugs with uh, therapies, cancer therapies that are known to prolong the QT interval could be uh, significantly dangerous. So I think these issues were highlighted very well in the scientific statement and the details are very important. I would encourage you to review this this statement and, and in particular, uh, figure one and table one are particularly helpful. Uh, we, we appreciate your consideration of, of the importance of these types of statements, and uh, we hope that this summary is useful.